everybody. And a good morning. I'm very happy to be again at a physical conference. Uh, it's so good to see everybody here in the room and have all these nice conversations, see colleagues again. And I'm also very happy to chair this second session, but maybe before I start, one uh, organizational announcement. If you have any questions regarding uh, the conference or with the local organization, you can always go to the registration desk, but also people with a blue cord, so I have a black one. But if you have a blue cord, these folks can answer all your questions as well. Then, now the second session will start about symmetric uh, crypto, and we start with uh, our first invited talk uh, called Heavyweight Security via Lightweight uh, Crypto. And this is a pre-recorded talk, um, so please, please start a video. Hi everyone, it's a pleasure for me to join you today virtually. So my name is Matam Sonastura, and I have been working at NEST for the last 13 years. Uh, I, right now I'm co-leading the NEST Lightweight Cryptography Standardization Project. And today I would like to give you some information about this project, uh, what we have done before and where we are right now and our, also our next steps. But before I go into the details of uh, the Lightweight Cryptography Project, I would like to talk to you about the Advanced Encryption Standard. So 25 years ago, in 1997, NIST decided to develop a new standard. So it wanted to de develop a new standard for block ciphers that would replace the 64-bit bits. Uh, and NIST wanted to have an algorithm that would be secure for a long time and to be called the Advanced Encryption Standard. NIST decided that it would be beneficial to involve the cryptography community in the development of the standard and exactly from the beginning. So kind of an involvement like a partnership with the cryptography community. And this, the submission Rindell, designed by Johan Damon and Winston Tryman, was selected as the advanced encryption standard. And after, in December of 2001, after this five year of effort, the standard was finished, approved, and published. And I included three references in this slide. The first one uh, by Miles Smith explains the development of the standards. So it's a historical document that provides some insights about uh, the development process. And today, 25 years later, we can see that, okay, advanced encryption standard is the most widely adopted block, block cipher that we have, have today. Most of the modern processors have special hardware instructions to implement AES, and, and the cipher is also supported by many software libraries. The development of AES also had significant impact on economy, and to learn more about this, you can look at the second footnote. And after two, 20 years of this publication of the standard, NIST decided to review this um, standard and uh, published a NIST IR, NIST internal report, that provides a review of the standard. And it, it is still standing secure, and the algorithm is suitable to be used for years to come. Okay. But why do the crypto community continue designing new symmetric key primitives? Well, we could say we want to publish papers, we want to uh, go to conferences, but we also see big companies investing in designing new symmetric primitives. So there are some reasons for this as well. So maybe we want something beyond just traditional confidentiality and integrity, authentication, maybe we want something, some additional features. So we have some new applications, for example, uh, 
format preserving encryption, where we want to have preserve the format of the plain text in the ciphertext. So if the plain text was in, includes digit, then we want the ciphertext to include digits as well. Or we want to be able to search, like search queries on the encryption. We want to preserve the order of the plain text in the ciphertext. Uh, or we want to uh, obfuscate our implementations that are that are used in untrusted platforms through white box cryptography, or we want to have full disk encryption, or we want to use our ciphers in protocols like multi-party computation or zero knowledge proofs, where the cost of implementing a nonlinear gate is significantly higher than cost of implementing a linear gate. Or we want to have some new features, like um, nice misuse resistance. So the, when we design symmetric keys uh, primitives, we usually make assumptions. But these assumptions do not always hold in the real world. So the nonce that are supposed to be unique might be reused in the real world, or the keys that are generated, that are supposed to be generated randomly and independently might have some relationships in between. So related key security, or we want to have, for example, um, another example, release of unverified plain text, RUP security or key commitment, or we, we still want to be secure if there's a, uh, if we have some quantum computers someday or we want to have combined functionality. For example, we want to do authenticated encryption, but we want to do hashing as well. So can we do it more efficiently? And also maybe we want to be more suitable for constrained environments. So this is where the lightweight crypto comes in. So you can do any of these applications new features with AES, but because AES is not designed um, assuming that they, it will be used in these applications. And this wasn't part of the design. And we can actually design new primitives, assuming where, knowing where they will be used and uh, optimizing the design so that it, it will fit these applications better. So these are, these are called domain specific uh, ciphers. Okay, so yes, lightweight cryptography is mostly cryptography suitable for uh, constraint devices. So when, when we talk about constraint devices, we're talking about uh, devices that has have limited resources. It could be limited uh, memory or power. So RFID tags, sensors are examples for this. These are very common. The number of these devices increased uh, significantly, and they are used many in many new applications. And uh, in these applications, they typically uh, collect a lot of private data. It could be our location. It could be our number of steps, some health data. But we see that sometimes in these applications, this data is not protected. And there are there may be multiple reasons of this. And one of the reasons that we are interested in this, um, that there's actually a lack of cryptography standards that are suitable for these devices. And we know that NIST crypto standards are optimized for general purpose computers, not necessarily for these constraint devices. And usually they can be implemented in these devices, but they're not as efficient. Okay, so when we talk about lightweight cryptography, maybe we want to define weight of an algorithm. And it is a property of its implementation. And it also depends on different metrics uh, based on the target platform. For hardware applications, we typically consider the area, the circuit area where we implement this, uh, the circuit, uh, the circuit of the primitive, or we look at the latency or power consumption. For software and 
applications, we can look at code size or latency or memory usage. So we have uh, four examples here. Uh, these are the examples that we heard during our conferences, especially in, early in the uh, development process for the project uh, development. And uh, one of the examples is anti-counterfeiting applications. So the, typically RFID chips are used for these applications. They have uh, challenge response protocols. Uh, you want to detect if the product is fake or not. These, device, these chips usually have very small amount of memory, and if you have a hardware-oriented perimeter with a small area, it's typically more suitable for this application. Or we can look at healthcare applications. Uh, where we, for example, measure that we use devices that measure our blood pressure or um, blood sugar, pulse, they might be embedded in our body. And in those cases, we uh, want hardware-oriented primitives with small energy requirements. In vehicle communication, so it could be in-vehicle, vehicle-to-vehicle, road-to-vehicle, or driving assistance systems, uh, we, we want ciphers that has low, have low latency and maybe high triple. And as last example, uh, for uh, the smart home uh, appliances that usually have low end CPUs, we might be inter more interested in software oriented primitives that consume um, less CPU time and smaller RAM requirements. Okay, so how different is designing lightweight primitives than conventional? conventional designs. So it's kind of an engineering challenge. So we, again, similar to designing conventional uh, cryptographic algorithms, we, we want to find the optimal trade-off between the security, performance, and cost. So in uh, 2020, Jean-Philippe Amasson gave a talk, uh, again, at Real World Crypto called Too Much Crypto. So he was arguing that we were actually designing ciphers that had more number of rounds that it actually required. So he was claiming that we could actually reduce number of rounds of some of these ciphers without making them weaker. So this actually uh, wasn't a big problem for when you're using um, servers where crypto implementing crypto is cheap but it actually becomes a problem for these constraint devices that's why in earlier designs um the new designs included smaller security margins by design and shorter keys and smaller block sizes but at the same time over the last 20 years since the development of ads we have many improvements in the research uh, area. So we, we, we have new designs that uh, include smaller, simpler rounds. Maybe we, instead of using very big rounds like AES uh, big S-box, we can switch to smaller S-boxes. Instead of using uh, linear layers that are complicated, we could look we can uh, work with bit permutations, which are basically free in hardware. Or we could do simpler key schedules uh, using, for example, um, for permutation designs that use uh, sponge construction, where you don't actually need an additional key schedule. OK, so there is actually, um, there are things that we can do to implement uh, secure to design secure uh, crypto algorithms that are suitable for these uh, devices. And then this uh, started this lightweight cryptography standardization process. And uh, it is, the process is um, similar to the public, uh, public competi competitions that NIST has for, uh, the, for AES and also for the a SHA-3 hash function and post-quantum cryptography standardization. 
So it includes multiple rounds. And the goal of the project is to develop new guidelines, recommendations, and standards optimized for constraint devices. And our initial scope is to find, is to develop authenticated encryption with optional hashing for constraint and uh, constraint software and hardware environments. So you could either submit an authenticated encryption algorithm, or you can additionally, optionally support the hashing for soft functionality as well. Hashing with a uh, variable output length. Okay, so uh, NIST held two workshops uh, before the announcement, but in 2018, NIST published the submission requirements and evaluation criteria for the lightweight crypto standardization process. And uh, with the deadline of February of 2019, the project officially started. So the call included the requirements. So what were the requirements? Uh, we took the requirements we had Requirements about security, scan, requirements about design and implementations. Uh, we basically for AUAD, typical confidentiality and in integrity requirements. Uh, we put some requirements on the sizes of the keys and the length of the plain, plain text that the cipher is able to process securely. Of course, we want the uh, designs to perform better than the standards. So we were thinking about uh, AES with the with uh, GCM, ASGCM, and uh, we wanted the designs to be optimized for short messages and uh, reference implementations and optimized implementations that are compatible with the API are, were part of the requirements. And the evaluation criteria include many different parts. So, of course, the security is the biggest, um, most important part. Um, we wanted the designs to be mature enough. Uh, we want um, we looked at the security claims that the design uh, includes and the security proofs, for example, for the modes and amount of third party analysis, the security margin, and the design rationale of the candidates are the parts that we looked for the security. And for software benchmarking, of course, we looked at um, what the target devices and we're trying to co compile, optimize implementations, look at different performance metrics. And we wanted to do a fair comparison of the candidates and especially with uh, AES um, GCM. And then for uh, hardware performance, um, we wanted to look at the FPGA results, ASIC results, and different performance metrics. And again, we wanted to have a fair comparison of the uh, candidates. With additional features, um, we wanted to look at uh, side channel resistance of these uh, candidates, uh, misuse resistance, what happens if some of the assumptions are not, do not hold in real world. And uh, we also wanted to have some diversity of uh, algorithms. For example, some candidates were very similar to AES, um, maybe just changing the last round. So maybe the, we also considered the, the diversity of the algorithms. And uh, we also kept in mind that uh, post-quantum security uh, would be relevant in the new can be relevant in the new future. Okay, so after the call, we received 57 submissions and 56 of them were accepted as the round one candidates. So this was the same amount of candidates um, for the Caesar authenticated encryption competition. Okay, and so let's collect these algorithms and publish them take a look at the, uh, the internal uh, the files and after a quick check let's publish the, the submissions and very quickly uh, we received a lot of ob observations about these candidates and after four rounds this decided to go from 56 candidates to 32 candidates to eliminate the can 
the submissions that are less likely to be standardized. So we saw a lot of distinguishing attacks. We saw a lot of domain separation issues. We saw some designs that did not include a lot of design rationale and uh, no third party analysis. So we decided to uh, eliminate those candidates early so that we can focus more on the more promising candidates. And after round one, we published a status report that explains our decision. So we ended up having 32 uh, second round candidates. This was more manageable. And the candidates, if you divide them into two categories based on their functionality, so some of them all, all, approximately half included AAD only functionality, whereas the other half included AAD and hashing. So AAD only ones, um, were mostly based on block ciphers or tweakable block ciphers and were able to uh, have shorter, smaller internal state size. Whereas the designs candidates providing AAD and hashing, they, they were mostly based on permutations or a variant of uh, sponge constructions. Okay, then NIST uh, announced these 32 candidates and the round two started. Round two took uh, uh, almost about 20 months from August 2019 to March 2021. In the meanwhile, we hosted two workshops. And uh, towards the end of this round um, two, we asked the submitters to provide some sub status updates. So uh, if there were a third party analysis, how would you respond to this? Or if you have some new security proofs or um, if you have new implementations, so it, 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 we wanted to give the designers uh, a chance to support their uh, submissions. And most of the, the evaluation of the candidates were done based on their security and the performance. In round one, it was mostly based on the uh, security. And uh, here we had the chance of looking uh, their software and hardware benchmarks as well. And Again, at the end of round two, we published a status report explaining the, the decision uh, process. Okay, so how did we do software benchmarking? Uh, so we had an internal team uh, that uh, looked at the uh, implementations and uh, did some internal benchmarking, but also we had some external teams that looked at uh, uh, the, the performance of the software and the different uh, microcontrollers and some different metrics. This is just an example that uh, com uh, compares um, code size versus uh, time uh, measurements. And we, we see that the ones, the algorithms that are inside this red circle in this uh, platform are actually provide better performance than uh, ABS-GCM. So ASCON and Photon Beetle are the examples. We also did some software benchmarking um, that com directly compares each candidate with ABS-GCM. So we included relative timings for each candidate um, in a matrix form. And uh, on the uh, here, here you could see the highlighted parts are actually the parts are the parts where uh, the algorithm provide a, a performance advantage over um, over AES and uh, ASCON, state Gimli, not so um, and additional ciphers were able to actually perform better than AES UCM on this uh, microcontroller. So these. Uh, results are available on our GitHub web page. Okay, and for hardware benchmarking, we mostly relied on uh, third party analysis. So, this did not do any uh, internal analysis, but just looked at the available results by mainly by the GMU team and other teams that I listed here. And this is uh, just an example a throughput over area figure uh, but that is 
graph that generated by the GMU team. Here in this uh, figure, we see that Subterranean, Zodiac, Ascon, and Gift, uh, and Gimli are providing, um, are performing very well in compared to the other candidates. Okay, so uh, we had 32 candidates and we looked at their performance, software performance, hardware performance, uh, and their uh, available third party analysis. And we reduced these candidates to 10. So this was the end of round two, and we ended up uh, in uh, we selected candidates moving to the final round of the uh, standardization. Okay, so we're in round three, final round, uh, which started last March, uh, March of 2021. And so during the start of round three, uh, the finalists were given an opportunity to update their submission packages and also propose tweak to their submissions. And we have quite a few algorithms that actually did want to use uh, this opportunity, and some of them increase their number of rounds, uh, whereas some actually decrease uh, the number of rounds, uh, claiming that the, their security margin was uh, more than enough. And round three, we're also expecting to get some results that uh, for side channel resistance of these candidates. So uh, the third theme from George Mason University uh, proposed a general framework to evaluate the side channel resistance of the finalists. And they had proposed three calls, side channel secu uh, security or validation calls and protected hardware implementations and protected software implementations. And uh, we will talk about these. Uh, so this is a new initiative and we will rely on the results of this study to make our decision, uh, the, the final decision and uh, side channel resistance of these candidates will also be considered in the uh, last round of the evaluation. And um, we are also planning to host a workshop which will be next month, May uh, 9 to 11. Uh, the workshop is going to be virtual. The accepted papers are already announced on our website and uh, the registration is open right now. And um, so uh, we will hopefully have a chance to discuss uh, in detail how we are going to proceed and uh, how we're going to evaluate the candidates, uh, the remaining uh, parts of the round three. And uh, this slide just summarizes the timeline of the project. So uh, the early stage from 2015 to 2018, we have hosted the first and the second workshop. And we also published the report uh, summarizing our observations, a report on lightweight cryptography. And in 2019, we had the call, um, uh, the submissions were due, and uh, we had the round one, uh, and published the NIST IR8168, which is the status first status report. And then round two started, and we had the uh, third workshop. In 2020 and 21, we had the fourth workshop, and uh, round three started. We had we published the second round report. And in 2022, we will have the fifth workshop, and hopefully, we're planning to announce the winner in the 2022. Okay, what are our next steps? So we, we are going to continue to evaluate the candidates. We are going to host the fifth lightweight cryptography workshop in May. And depending on our results, how comfortable we are with our decision, we are hoping to make our decision, uh, the selection of a winner or winners uh, by before the end of this year. Um, and we will, of course, again, publish a stated report uh, explaining, justifying our decision. And then the standardization process will begin. Okay, yeah, so I would like to end my note with, um, and my talk with a note saying that uh, although the name includes lightweight, this protection, this cryptography doesn't mean weak. It doesn't mean um, we cannot rely on these. 
that they, they are just tailored for constraint devices. They are designed slightly differently with different concerns. And um, hopefully we're gonna have a standard that, will, that can be used in these devices and people will start uh, using this standard. Okay, thank you for listening. So if you want to contact us, this is our um, email address. We have a public forum and we have a project web page where we, all of the announcements, important announcements are uh, done through either the forum or the website. And we also have a GitHub web page that includes the implementations. Thank you everyone. Thanks also to the organizers of the workshop. So if there are any questions, Meltem is in the Zoom chat or in the Zoom room, so she can take any questions. If you have a question, please come forward to the microphone. So, hi Meltem, thanks for the, this nice uh, um, talk. Uh, so uh, connecting to your last comment on uh, the fact that lightweight is still very secure, uh, so I'm, I'm wondering, do you think that uh, will it still make sense beside the legacy uh, to use AES or Shatri as primitives if uh, the lightweight primitives already provide a very high security? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so of course, uh, uh, this, these primitives will not be a replacement for AES or Shatri. I mean, if they support hashing uh, or a replacement for SHA-2 or SHA-3. So uh, they will not be very efficient in, uh, in servers or big PCs, so where, they, where we have uh, AES instructions. So they will be uh, probably very slow in those in, uh, environments. So uh, they won't be a replacement. This is just tailored for small devices. Thank you so much. I think um, yeah, we are running out of time and I'm gonna switch to the next speaker. If there are any questions still pending, let's go to the, uh, we can answer that in the chat. Uh, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. Then we continue the symmetric cryptography session um, with a, Presentation titled Rocked Pseudo Random Permutations and Their Applications, which should be on the screen soon. Um, and the speaker will be uh, Jean Paul. Hello. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So, uh, this talk is based on two works one with uh, Vukashin Karadzic and another one with Alessandro Meloni, Jean Pierre Moon, and Martin Einstein. And the notion of rugged PRPs has been developed in parallel in these two works. So I start this talk by defining what rugged PRPs are and showing a construction. I'll then show how we can transform rugged PRPs into AAD schemes. Then I'll introduce a new primitive called non-set AAD, and I'll show how it can be realized from rugged PRPs and how this is useful in the context of orders in channels. And then I'll also show in a very briefly how Rugged PRPs can be beneficial to Tor. So let's start with the definition. So from a syntactical point of view, a rugged PRP is simply a tweakable cipher, a variable length tweakable cipher over a split domain, meaning that its inputs and outputs consist of pairs of strings, where the left string is of some fixed size n, and the right string is of variable length. And the ciphering algorithm, which takes a tweak and an input XL and XR, returning YL and YR, and the corresponding deciphering algorithm, which re reverses this process. Then, from the point of view of security, the security of a rugged PRP sits right in between that of a pseudorandom permutation and a strong pseudorandom permutation. And intuitively, the way we achieve this is by only giving partial access to the ciphering algorithm whereas the adversary has full access to the enciphering algorithm. So let's look at the definition in more detail. In the real world, the adversary has access to an enciphering oracle and a deciphering oracle, 
but we impose two further restrictions on what queries can the adversary make to the deciphering rocket. So the first constraint is that the adversary can make a query involving a value YL that was returned already by the enciphering oracle, no matter what the values of T and Y are. The second constraint is that it cannot make, it cannot repeat values of YL across deciphering queries. And these turn out to be quite significant constraints on the adversary. So in order to make the uh, definition more useful, we add a second way that the adversary can interact with the deciphering algorithm. And this is via a third oracle called the guess oracle, where here the adversary supplies, in addition to the inputs to the deciphering algorithm, he supplies a guess, XL prime, of the left output. And the oracle only returns true or false, indicating whether the guess was correct or not. So then, so in summary, the adversary has two ways of interacting with the deciphering algorithm. One where um, the, the, the queries are constrained, but then the adversary gets the full output. And the second one, the guess oracle, where there's no constraints on the queries, but the adversary only gets one bit of output. So then in the ideal world, we simply replace a tweakable cipher with an ideal cipher. And then uh, we note that the adversary is only able to make with a, an ideal permutation, with an ideal cipher, an adversary is only able to make a successful guess query with negative probability. So we simplify the definition with Berder and replace it with a dummy oracle that only returns false, no matter what the input is. And then for this definition to be useful, or satisfiable, sorry, we must um, ensure that the adversary does not make uh, queries that are trivial to guess, right? So that's the definition in full. Let's now look at potential constructions. So what I'm showing you here is the PIV construction, uh, which was proposed in 2013 by Shimter and Tarashima. And this constructs a variable length tweakable cipher that is secure in the SPRP sense, meaning it's a strong pseudorandom permutation. It consists of three layers two of which are a fixed input length tweakable cipher that can handle a large tweak. And the middle layer, which is simply a variable output length PRF F that can normally be essentially with something like AS in counter mode. So now if we take this construction and truncate the last layer, we get what we call the UIV construction. And while this construction is not sufficient for a strong PRP, it suffices for a rugged PRP. In addition, it can be instantiated with GCM components, leading to performance characteristics that are very similar to GCM SIV. And it's also closely related to another scheme, an AED scheme, which is called GCM RAP, and which was proposed in Crypto 2017 by um, Ashur, Dunkelman, and Luix. But I'll come to that in a bit more later. So what are other PRPs good for? For one thing, we can easily transform them into non-spaced AED schemes with varying uh, security properties. So the problem of translating a cipher into an AED scheme dates back to the work of Belay and Rogoy from 2000 in what they call the encoder and cipher paradigm, which was then revisited by Shimto and Tarashima 2013. However, these prior works assumed that the cipher was a strong PRP. Whereas here we'll make do with a weaker primitive, which is the rugged PRP. So in our first construction, the ATA construction, we simply replace the tweak with an encoding of the nonce and the header. We place the message in the right input, and we put some redundant bits, fixed zero bits, in the left input. Then during the encryption, we decipher in the natural way, and we check whether the left output is equal to the O0 string. And if that's the case, the encryption has succeeded and we return the message M. Otherwise, the encryption fails. So then we show that if the underlying cipher is rugged PRP, not only this gives us a secure AED scheme, but also one that is secure against misuse. Now, the asymmetry between uh, ciphering and deciphering and the definition of rugged PRPs 
prompts us to consider a different construction where we use deciphering to encrypt and we use enciphering to decrypt because these give different have different security properties. So things get a bit trickier here um, because if you remember the definition, we cannot repeat the YL value in deciphering. So that becomes a natural candidate where to place the nonce. So we place the nonce in the left input. We only put the header in the tweak. And now we put the redundant bits in the right part. And this turns out to be OK in this case because we're using enciphering to decrypt, but it wouldn't have been OK in the previous construction. And then we decrypt in the natural way. And this construction instead, assuming always that the underlying cipher is a regular PRP, this gives us an AAD scheme, a once hiding AAD scheme, that is secure against um, under the release of unverified plain text. And when instantiated with GCM UIV, this corresponds exactly to the scheme that I mentioned before, GCM RAP. However, we can instantiate this construction slightly differently in order to have more compact ciphertext. So essentially what we can do is get rid of the zero bits and simply use the nonce for the redundancy to get the integrity check. Right, so here decryption uh, simply verifies that the recovered nonce is equal to the supplied nonce. And this way, we still get a scheme that is secure under the reason of unverified plain text, but it has a more compact ciphertext when compared to GCM wrap. Okay, so another application of rugged PRPs is to inter we can also build a slightly more general primitive than AAD, which we call non-set AAD. So this last trick of using the nonce to authenticate can also be done with the ETE construction, the first construction we saw. And this gives rise to the construction shown here. But we can go a step further and to generalize it more and replace the security test during decryption with a set membership test, where now decryption takes a set of nonces W and authentication succeeds if the recovered nonce is in that set. And this is what we call the AWM transform, and it transforms a rugged PRP into a non-set AAD. Um, yeah. That is also misuse resistant. So let me define what is non-set AAD more formally. So in the syntax, the only thing that changes is the decryption algorithm. So now decryption takes a set of nonces W and returns a pair of strings, n and m, or two error messages. And it must hold also that the recovered nonce is in the set that was applied to the decryption algorithm. Then correctness can be easily adapted to mean that whenever the nonce, or whenever this nonce set w contains the nonce that was used to encrypt that ciphertext, um, decryption should succeed. And security also trans translates in a straightforward manner we only need to adapt the definition of prohibited queries that the adversary cannot make to the decryption algorithm. And in this case, it should be that uh, the adversary cannot query, make a query with W containing the nonce that was used to produce that ciphertext. So then, what is nonce at AAD useful for? Right? So my motivation is that it's natural primitive in the context of order resilient channels, such as quick and the TLS. And I will show you next that we can generically transform any non-set AAD into such a channel for a wide class of functionalities. And it turns out also that non-set AAD can be constructed in a black box manner from non hiding AAD, but the AW construction is advantageous because it constructed directly and results in more compact ciphertext as well. So what do we mean exactly by order Z in channels? This is essentially the channel component of protocols like Quick and the TLS, which need to operate over UDP, and hence need to be able to handle out-of-order delivery of ciphertext. And when constructing such channels, a variety of possibilities arise, depending on how to handle reorderings, replays, corruptions, and deletions, and how much of each to allow. And typically, constructions uh, make use of one or more window mechanisms which tend to complicate 
the design of such channels, making them hard to analyze and understand. From a mathematical perspective, we can capture the functionality of a secure of an order zero in channel via something called a support predicate, which then permeates to all aspects of the channel, from correctness to security to the recent notion of robustness. So this is our construction for translating non sat AED into an order zero in channel. So its first component is the non sat AED here shown in blue, and the second component is a tuple of algorithms, which we call the non-set processing algorithms, um, shown in red. So the first algorithm simply is initialization. Then non extract used in send, takes the current state and extracts a nonce and updates the state. That's going to be, and the nonce is then fed to the encryption algorithm. So this non extract here can simply be, for example, a counter. Then at the receiver end, uh, things are a bit more interesting. We have this non-set policy algorithm which from the state extracts a set of nonces that are then fed to the decryption algorithm. And decryption then returns a nonce on the message that nonce is fed to the state update algorithm together with the state. The state is updated and based on that nonce. And a message number is recovered for the associated message. So the interesting aspect here is that we're able to prove this construction secure, correct, and robust. Um, for any non set AAD and for any support predicate that we desire. So any desired functionality, this template construction always works. And the point is that the security relies only on the non set AAD part, right? The other algorithms need only to satisfy a functional requirement that they faithfully implement the support predicate. So an implementer can change the definitions of non extract, non set policy and say tablet however they want in order to get this desired functionality. And automatically, the channel is guaranteed to be secure. So finally, let me briefly outline uh, the application of WPRPs to Tor. So for quite some time now, Tor has been known to be su um, susceptible to tagging attacks, which undermine its privacy. And the main suggestion for addressing this is to replace the onion encryption so that each layer of the onion encryption scheme is a white block cipher or a white block strong PRP. However, in concurrent work, we show that um, one can do it less. That is, a rugged PRP is sufficient for this purpose. And one can build a scheme um, from rugged PRPs. Actually, we're, we're drafting a proposal based on GCMUIV that is, in addition, forward secure protects against tagging attacks. And according to our benchmarks, it provides very competitive performance. So to conclude, we've introduced rugged PRPs, which provide a new trade-off between security and performance. And I hope I convince you that they're useful in a variety of applications. We're also currently exploring alternative constructions besides the UAV construction. And we also believe that non set AED is the right abstraction for understanding and constructing all the resilient channels. So that concludes my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Please come forward to the microphone. Thank you so much. This is a really cool little, little thing. Um, OK. So this is the first time I'm hearing about this. My impression is that this would help so much with protocol design, especially when folks were working on Quick. I'm curious if you came up with this idea, like when you developed this idea, and if you were like looking at the Quick standard when you were thinking about it. Um, yeah, it mostly came out of Tor and then realized that um, it could be applied to channels as well. And we were looking at the robust paper, uh, the robust channels paper on quick. So yeah, there was this mix of lucky events that led us to this. Cool. Thank you so much for, for uh, describing this thing. You're welcome. All right, let's thank the speaker again. <laughs> so this concludes the session, but don't go anywhere yet, because now we have the award ceremony. Oh, 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 hello, hello, okay, could you put up the